May is a time where hope springs eternal, when seniors in high school and college walk across the stage in cap and gown to receive their diploma marking the end of a chapter and the beginning of a new one, but not this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed all of that. What was once a rite of passage has been canceled or postponed or morphed into a virtual one. My son received his email notification from Northwestern notifying that the graduation scheduled for June 19th would now be virtual. Not to worry. They will be able to walk with the graduating class in 2021 if they choose to. I can only imagine the disappointment and heartache many seniors are feeling when was when what was a time that was to be about them to celebrate their achievements to acknowledge their hard work gets caught up in a larger story of loss loss of job loss of health and even loss of life because of this virus if it's any consolation this is the story the setting of our story from Acts loss. We learn of Stephen's witness to his Jewish brethren that they have crucified their long-awaited Messiah. And not surprisingly, the same powers that killed Jesus are intent on killing Stephen, except this time it'll be by stoning instead of crucifixion at the hands of the Jews rather than at the hands of the Romans. And Saul of Tarsus, who we know as the Apostle Paul, will be there holding the coats of the high priest and other priests so as not to soil their fine outer garments when they exert themselves to stone Stephen and sweat. Stephen... We'll see the heavens open up and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God before he gives up his ghost, but not before pronouncing forgiveness as Jesus had done his crucifixion. Stephen will say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then Stephen will breathe his last breath and die. His witness and his death will make him the first martyr of the church. In fact, martyrdom will become so popular during the 200s because of Stephen's experience and others like Stephen that many will want to copy so that they can have a vision of the Lord and have saints light a candle for them and pray to them. In fact, Origen who would become the, first, the church's first great theologian, tried to become a martyr at the age of 12. But his mother forbidden him, prevented him from going outside where they were rounding up all the Christians. No doubt these were dark days in the Roman Empire for Christians. For any natural disaster could be blamed on them, a flood from a storm that overflowed the river banks, or an earthquake along a fault line that released the pressure, or a virus breaking out in the village. All of these natural disasters were interpreted as a sign that the Roman gods must be angry, and the Christians were naturally scapegoated, for they refused to offer sacrifice. To the Roman gods. They refused to participate in the cult of the emperor. This lack of patriotism did not go unpunished. So they hauled the Christian leaders out of their houses and demand that they bow down and worship Caesar. To refuse to do so would mean they would be killed in a gruesome fashion, torn apart by wild dogs, drawn and quartered by a team of horses, boiled in hot oil, crucified on a cross, 
Or if they were lucky, they were beheaded. An obvious question by a student of history is, why would anyone want to be a Christian under these circumstances? Some didn't. But unbelievably, the church grew during this period of persecution. And the question is, why? One answer among many might be because of the witness of the martyrs, especially in the way they embraced their death with such apparent serenity. Could it be that they knew the one who conquered death through his death and resurrection and drew strength from this? After all, did not Jesus say, do not fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who can kill the body and soul. And for Christians, this one sits at the right hand of God, judging the living and the dead, who assures them a place in paradise, like he did for the thief on the cross. See how they love one another became a saying that was repeated on the lips of many Romans when Christians risked their lives to take in those who had been abandoned by their own family because of the plague. These Christians did not see themselves as a victim of circumstance, no matter what life threw at them. For they worshiped the one who was Lord of heaven and earth. Instead, they took to heart to Jesus' words, as I have loved you, so love one another. And this you will demonstrate that you are my disciple. The way you love one another. I believe these words are relevant today as when Jesus first said them. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need not to be victim of what life throws at us. We can choose to love at all times, under all circumstance, even offering forgiveness for those who have done us wrong. We can never underestimate how God will use our witness to serve the larger narrative for his glory. He did it in the martyrdom of Stephen. Paul is watching in approval, but will end up being the church's greatest evangelist, all because he met the res risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Origen would not be allowed to become a martyr, but would grow up to be the church's first great teacher of the faith. As you can see, God used Origen's witness in another way than by dying for the faith. Likewise, there's no telling how God will use your disappointment and heartache over your senior year for his glory. Know this, God is not done with you yet. Acknowledge your loss and disappointment to him, but through it all be determined to love at all times and in every circumstance. Hold on to the friends you have made these past four years. They will serve you well for the rest of your life. Also, trust that your life is being put together by the master builder as Peter reminded his congregation. For you are a living stone. What kind of house the Lord will build out of your life, time will will only tell. In many ways, you have a part to play. Don't worry if your house doesn't look like your best friend, or your brothers or sisters, or even your parents. What matters is that Christ is your cornerstone. For if the cornerstone is faulty because we trust in our own resources and not in God, then do not be surprised to see it tumbling down and having to start all over and building the great cathedrals of Europe. Ken Follett in Pillars of the Earth tells the story of one family and two master builders, Tom and his son Jack, who would build the cathedral in the fictional town of Kingsbridge. 
What is remarkable is how the building starts in Norman architecture with thick walls and wooden ceiling and ends up in Gothic architecture with a vaulted ceiling and stone riveted roof and flying buttresses. But not before many mishaps along the way. What made Gothic architecture superior to Norman architecture was the flying buttresses, which allowed the windows of the church to be large, to let the light in. All one has to do is visit the cathedral of Ely and see the big barrel stone columns blocking the view of a person who wants to see up front, and the windows are so, so small. But with Gothic, Gothic architecture, like the Cathedral of Salisbury with flying buttresses, the thin stone riveted ceilings and the huge stained glass windows tell the story of Christ what story would your life tell if you were a cathedral and the master builder was Christ? We would have a nativity window, and many of us would have a confirmation window, and we would even have maybe a graduation window and also scenes about the pandemic. But thankfully... There are more windows in this cathedral Christ is building. What goes in them will be up to you and the master builder, of course, especially to the extent that you allow yourself to be built into a spiritual house with Christ as the cornerstone. Listen to how 1 Peter describes it. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Just as God is building a great edifice out of your life, you're a part of a greater edifice called the church in which you're one of the living stones that make up this magnificent structure. Your gifts and talents are not yours alone. They're part of something bigger, as Stephen discovered, as Paul discovered, as Origen discovered, and those who have gone on to meet their eternal reward have discovered. The stained glass windows of my life tell a story of graduating from North Carolina State University with a degree in accounting and business management. Little did I know that I would soon be going on to get to seminary to get a degree in ministry at Union Presbyterian Seminary and serve a church in Monroe, North Carolina for eight years and then go on to Columbia Sermon Seminary when I got a master's in theology and where I met my wife, future wife, Catherine McCluskey. I would then serve a church in Aurora, Colorado for eight years. I would get married to Catherine, and we would have two children, Andrew and Emma. After serving eight years, I'd be called to a church in Lincoln, Nebraska. My kids would come to know Lincoln as their home as they got involved in scouting, soccer, band camp, and youth group. After eight years, I'd be called to Wichita to serve this church. And one day there will be a window describing my death. But that is not the end of this edifice. For all of us who are built into the living edifice called the church have a resurrection window too. For death is not the end of my personal existence. Life does go on with God at the center of it all. Personally, I don't know how God, as a master architect, will complete the stained glass windows of my life. 
I hope it involves teaching after I retire from ministry. I'm doing all that I can to make it happen, but some things are out of my control. What is in my control is to love at all times, under all circumstances, as I trust in the power and goodness of God, to use my life as a witness to the ongoing story that includes me, but is much bigger than me. So what I want to say to the seniors as a graduation address is this. Know that God is the master builder and that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of your life. And allow God to build a grand cathedral out of it so others coming after you will be able to look up and see the stained glass windows that allow the light and love of your life to shine through. And just as every cathedral takes a lifetime to build and many people along the way to help build it, so it is with you. You might not know how God is going to use this stone, which seems a stumbling block, but God does. For stumbling blocks become just another stone for the master builder to use. Also, don't forget that the church is the living, living edifice that as you, as a living stone, are a part of and needs you to allow the love and Christ to shine and manifest itself here and wherever you end up. Therefore, I leave you with these words. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.